Hello everyone, good afternoon, welcome, thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Eurocontrol Aviation Straight Talk Live, the program where we talk to uh, the important people in the aviation industry and try to work out what's going on. Today, interestingly, for the first time, we're talking to an aircraft lessor, Avalon uh, Aircraft Leasing, a very large player in the, in the, lease, in the leasing industry and, an, and a company that's really put itself at the forefront for things like sustainability and also EV tolls and electric aircraft. A really interesting topic and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking to Mr Donald Slattery of the CEO of Avalon on all of these matters. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I hope you are too. But as ever at Straight Talk, before we do that, I'll ask the DG of Eurocontrol, Mr. Raymond Brennan, if he'd be so kind as to bring us up to date with what's going on in the market. Good afternoon. Thank you, Andrew, and a special welcome this afternoon to Donald Slattery, the CEO of Avalon. Before we get into the interview with um, Donald and Andrew, I'd like to spend a few minutes just reviewing how traffic has evolved over the last number of weeks. The Russian war of aggression in Ukraine has caused a major shift in the way traffic is handled in Europe. We now have a different spine of traffic operating more to the left of Europe, operating through Turkey and the Balkans. So we're seeing big shifts. Some states are getting a lot of extra traffic. Some states are getting a lot less. And this is happening. You can see it very clearly from the map there, the effect on the Ukraine and on Moldova as well. It's also worth mentioning that this crisis has caused a non-precedented spike in jet fuel prices. We haven't seen anything like this since perhaps the early 90s, late 80s. And if you look, for instance, it's at $152 a barrel, which is an increase of 119% over a year ago. I remember when, you know, it was said that at 100 dollars a barrel, there were many, many airlines that were not viable. So we have to see how things shake out if this continues over the next number of months, particularly airlines that are not hedged. I think it's also important to say, though, that things are doing well despite the war um, in Europe. First of all, we've had a solid network recovery. We're at 82% of our 2019 figures over the Easter period, which has gone very well. That represents 25,000 daily flights. And we're now seeing an increase. That's 3% up on the previous week. So this is really good. And I'm really excited about this. Also, I just want to mention to you is that the effect on the markets, and if we look at the top 10 states, and I've showed you this every single time we have a briefing, but now we're starting to get into realistic terms. The United Kingdom is only 18% down. Spain is only 8% down, and these are on 2019. Italy is only 9% down. So we're seeing a recovery in the broad European market. But the good news is there are actually some states that are above the 2019 levels, like Norway, like Romania, and Portugal getting very close to 2019 levels. So we're seeing a strong recovery in Europe, and that's what's actually happening on the ground. Now, the next question really is, how does this play out around the world? So, first of all, if you look at our figures there, the balance up, we really are at 88% within Europe, if you look at within Europe there. And the North Atlantic, you know, is only 7% down. So the high value flights of the North Atlantic are back, really coming towards where we were in 2019, only 7%. Middle East, a little bit softer, but the disaster, of course, is Asia Pacific. We're looking at a continued lockdown in China, 41% reduction, and this is dragging everything down, and it's placing particular problems on the hub carriers. So the, first of all, let's look at the low cost carriers. So they've been driving the growth, particularly over the Easter period and the summer. Ryanair, the largest, with 2,751 flights, is up 9%. EasyJet starting to come strongly back with 1,500 flights. And you can see Voiling is only down 9%, Pegasus, Whiz and Eurowings, all starting to put more capacity back into the market. So as long as everything stays OK and they can survive the price of fuel for a while, let's see how the market evolves. But I would say that with the price of fuel, we will probably see fares starting to rise in the medium term and perhaps the whole advent of a fuel surcharge coming back on again. Now, if we look at the long haul carriers, now here you see the problem. 
Asia hasn't returned. So Lufthansa, minus 24%. Hub and spoke operations been reduced there because there's no carry on to Asia. But doing quite well profitably from a cargo point of view. The same with Air France, British Airways, KLM, generally down. So really, until we start getting Asia Pacific opened up again, we're going to struggle with getting the major hubs back into full operation. And this is reflected in the airports and it's reflected in passenger numbers as well. One thing I would say is that over the last number of weeks, the biggest strain on the system has not been the airlines, it's been the airports. Security, uh, baggage handling, um, checking, all of these things, getting people back and getting the airports back up to 100% has been very difficult throughout Europe. Also, I think it's mentioned, worth mentioning Avalon, our guest today. Basically, they're were founded in 2012, so they're quite a young company. They leased to 142 airlines in 61 countries, and sustainability is their big thing. You'll see this from Donald today when he talks a lot about making sure to get the best value aircraft, but also the ones that have the greenest performance. And while we're talking about that, they have 832 aircraft committed for on their books. And you can see that it's basically a large range of A321s, uh, A320neos, etc., some 7 sevens, but with an emphasis on a younger fleet and an emphasis actually away from um, markets. They haven't actually suffered as much as some other leasers with the collapse of the Russian market, but they are actually very heavy in China and Southeast Asia as well. And Donald will explain this to you later. The other thing I would say what makes uh, Avalon really different is they are a major investor in urban air mobility. They are buying 500 of these um, aircraft, eVTOL aircraft. And so what's really interesting about this is that it represents a really significant investment by a mainstream aviation leaser. And I'm really looking forward to Donald commenting on why he's doing this and what the business case for this is. So that's it from Brussels this afternoon. I look forward to a very good um, interview between Andrew and Donald. And thank you very much for tuning in to your control today. Karmila Mahogov. Donald, thanks very much for joining us and welcome to Straight Talk. I have to say there's been a lot of interest uh, on Twitter and so forth for this. Do you get the feeling that the leasing industry is perhaps less well understood and less appreciated than many of the other parts of the aviation industry? I would say uh, if we went back 10 or maybe 20 years, I, I would agree with that, Andrew. But I, I think today, no, I, I think the aircraft leasing uh, sector is such a central part of not just the financing of aircraft, but helping the manufacturers think about future designs of aircraft and what will be relevant uh, to the airlines in the future, but, but also not just from an operational perspective, but from a residual value perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the stats are, are, are compelling. I mean, over 50% of all of the aircraft delivering from the manufacturers each year are effectively financed by the lessors. So lessors really are the dominant source of capital in this industry now. And, and, and I think- and when you say finance, do you mean actually purchased by, don't you? Yeah, I think uh, lessors kind of participate in two ways, right? Uh, the big players like ourselves, um, we have significant purchase contracts with the manufacturers. Um, so for example, Avalon, my company, we believe we're Airbus' second largest customer in the world. Um, so lessors, they, they speculatively buy aircraft from, from the manufacturers many years into the future. Mm. And the second thing that we do in scale is we provide uh, what we call sale and leaseback financing to the airlines closer to the point of delivery. And the big lessors, with the big balance sheets, certainly the ones that have investment grade, play in both of those spaces as mm. we do. So you said, and I thought it was very interesting, you said that you were sort of two ways if you like you 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 work with the airlines but interestingly you also work with the airframe manufacturers uh to what extent therefore is sustainability and lowering of emissions uh, an important part of what you're doing yeah so i would say uh in the 12 years that avalon has been around uh sustainability as an issue has moved from being a sideshow uh, sort of dinner party chat to being an absolute core central element of our strategic positioning in the industry. And Avalon has prided itself over the years, um, and I don't say this in any egotistical way, but we pride ourselves on being a thought leader in the industry. What's next? What's important? And 
frankly, we believe that our higher purpose as a firm, you know, beyond our vision, beyond our strategy, is to lead the decarbonization of the of the global aviation industry, which may sound audacious, and I think it is. It may not ultimately be attainable, but we must strive for it. And it's a multi-decade, um, it's a multi-decade challenge. And what we found, Andrew, over the last year or two is we've articulated that vision to our stakeholders uh, and the capital markets and others, is we're hiring the absolute best talent we've ever seen because all these young kids coming out of university, super bright, super ambitious, super careful, they want to work with a company that has a real meaning and a real purpose. And for a very long time, I didn't think Avalon had a real purpose in life, but now I have a sort of burning desire around this, you know, leading this decarbonization thought leadership piece. So how do you see that going? Do, do you see, obviously we've spoken to your brother from GE, John. Uh, do you Ooh. see, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you talk about at Christmas? I want to know. The, um, the, the, the to, is, it, is it all about doing what we're doing but better, or do you think it's actually into break breakthrough new technologies? Look, I, I think, Andrew, this is uh, obviously it's a big and complex issue. Um, I'll come back to what we talk about at Christmas dinner, but it's it's top down and it's bottoms up. So top down is the kind of stuff that John is is deeply engaged in, and that is um, you know reimagining the propulsion of modern aircraft, specifically hydrogen. Um, and I'm an absolute believer that hydrogen powered aircraft will become the primary source of, of, of propulsion, perhaps from the, later in the next decade, but there, thereafter. Um, SAF closely follows that. Uh, and the, the combination of both of those technologies will move the needle in the decarbonization piece. We're kind of playing our piece in two big ways. Number one, um, we invest exclusively in new technology aircraft. So Avalon has the, the most fuel efficient and youngest fleet of the top players globally. But that's just kind of, you know, that sounds good and it ticks a box and it feels good. But practically what we've done is we've embraced the emerging technologies in the electric space. So we've mm -hmm. made a major step forward in, in, in the eVTOL space, yeah, yeah. which is really, you know, I call it the baby step, right? It's not going to solve the problem, but it's a demonstration of our intent, our strategic intent. And you know, as the CEO of an aircraft I saw, I strive for these, you know, what I call the moments of truth conversations with airline CEOs around the world. And most of the time, they don't really want to talk to aircraft I saw because we've got much more important things to talk about. But I can tell you in the last 12 or 18 months, they all want to talk about decarbonization and they're all very engaged in this electrification. Is that right? Electrification as well. And I mean, I'll come back to eVTOLs because I'm really fascinated by it. But just before we get to that, to what extent do you think we, we need to focus on the manufacturing process for aircraft as well. I mean, mining isn't the world's cleanest in industry and we, we dig up a lot of aluminium. Well, we dig up bauxite. We turn it into aluminium mm -hmm. and so forth. Are you focusing also on the sort of downstream issue or is that upstream? The upstream issues, do you think? Look, I think it's an, these are upstream issues. What we, what we try to do is just create awareness uh, with our OEM partners that we think this is really important. But the good news is they think it's really important too, right? So we can't determine where the OEMs, you know, buy their stuff from or how they ultimately design their airplanes, but we can try and in influence them. And um, I think the good news here is that we're a huge global complex industry, but actually if you put the top 100, 150 key players in the industry into one room, uh, whether it's the OEMs, the airlines, or the lessors, you can make stuff happen. It's a very efficient industry in that respect. And so there is a complete alignment of interest globally that decarbonization is, is, is the only way forward. And I think in many ways, outside of the SAF and hydrogen piece, which is you know, the big needle mover, it'll be what I call the 101%, right? You know, the same philosophy in, 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 in professional cycling, right? There's, it'll be 101%. It'll be that pilot in the cockpit uh, having a piece of technology which says, here's a faster way or a better way to taxi from the gate out to the runway. Um, and, and in fact, GE have been doing a lot of work in that area um, and some very interesting work that I think should be adopted globally. But, uh, but will you, as Avalon, get involved in that sort of stuff as well? Well, I think our involvement is the billions of dollars and the checks that we write to the manufacturers and the demands that we put in place to say, we must have the most fuel efficient aircraft. 
you need to keep investing in R&D, you need to keep pushing the needle. And the reality is, um, in my view, if you look back over the last 20 years, the fleet has doubled for mm -hmm. all intents and purposes, right? Um, but our total emissions score, while it's not acceptable in any way, has broadly remained you know, sub 3%. So our industry has actually done a pretty good job at being efficient. What it's not done a good job is articulating that globally and influencing people that we are a responsible industry. I could list out three or four other industries that are pretty dirty and are way behind mm. where we are, in terms of we being our global aviation industry, are in our thinking in this area. Yeah, uh 3% of course still makes us Germany in terms of emissions, but uh, I agree with that. Why though? Why isn't the message cutting through? Why can't we get traction on this? Well, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're an easy target, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's the first thing. Um, um, but I just think we need to continue delivering, you know, at, at sort of at a regulatory level, at a social media level, at the other end of the spectrum, the good work that we're all doing in the industry to try and get to get to the right answer. And, you know, I'm constantly being challenged. I've got four young daughters, right, about, you know, should we be traveling? Dad is travel, you know. So I sat the four of them down recently. Now, these are four women who are highly independent and take no direction from their father. And <laughs> I, I know said, that I problem. I said, if I gave you a challenge, I said, stop traveling the world uh, or become a vegan or a vegetarian. Which would you do? And they said, well, we become a vegetarian because we're not stopping travel. Yeah. Because we want to see the world. And it's a sort of an anecdotal story because, you know, if we had more vegetarians in the world, we'd actually solve a great deal of the, of the, of the emissions problem. So people are not going to stop traveling, Andrew. Mm. And this sort of notional idea that they will, uh, I just don't think it's founded on any kind of real um, psychological fact. People want to, and certainly post-COVID, I mean, the stats that we're seeing globally are astounding, astounding in terms of people's de desire and demand to get on airplanes. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the pent-up demand is unpenting at a very great rate. I think there's no doubt about that. How did you survive COVID? Was COVID a, almost an existential crisis for the leasing industry? Um, that's a very good question. I've thought about it uh, long and hard. And uh, I think when the history books are written, if anybody ever writes a history book about aircraft leasing, I might, because um, I just get so excited about it. <laughs> I think uh, when, the, when the history books are written about this period that we've just been through for aircraft leasing, I will think that the historians will say, this is the moment in the, in the evolution of our industry where we proved as a sector how resilient we were to the most existential shock possible. I mean, this was a flock of black swans. Mm. Um, and so I think the aircraft leasing industry was suffered financially through that two year period, and it will take us time to heal back. We've actually proven to the capital markets, uh, to our equity shareholders and others, that actually we can pretty much survive anything if you can get through COVID. Yeah. Uh, our liquidity uh, from an Avalon perspective, you know, the cash on balance sheet, our available lines, uh, which is the differentiator for success and failure, actually increased during COVID. And our cost of borrowing went down during mm, COVID, mm, mm. Uh, which you would think is counterintuitive, right? So I think um, it, it was the ultimate proving ground that our industry is here to stay it's the central plank of the global aviation food chain and um, onwards from here, really. Was it a huge opportunity to refresh your fleet, though, to get rid of some of the bigger, older, less em e efficient, less, you know, more emitting aircraft and, and stock in new aircraft? Yeah, maybe for others. We were lucky, Andrew, because, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that Avalon was just a startup, right, in 2010. I mean, mm. literally, we didn't own a single aircraft 12 years ago. Um, in fact, we'll celebrate our 12th birthday in three weeks' time. Mm. So we, were, we had the benefit of a de novo startup in 2010. So we carefully selected all of these young um, assets, new technology assets as they came online. So we didn't suffer the legacy fleet issue of some of our more incumbent uh, competitors. Um, which is just, you know, that's the reality of being around for multi-decades. Mm. If you don't have a very proactive asset management strategy of, you know, selling the aircraft consistently off the balance sheet. So from our perspective, we didn't really have the clunkers to deal with. We didn't really have the big portfolio of unattractive wide bodies to deal with. We did have some. I mean, we certainly didn't get through it on scale, but, but not some of the challenges, uh, fundamental challenges that some of our competitors have.
Right. So what about the new or the next fundamental challenge, which is what's going on in Russia? Do you have an exposure to the aircraft that have suddenly been nationalised in Russia? Uh, yes, we do. Um, um, we, uh, we've spoken about this publicly, uh, as I think most of the major players yeah. have. The, you know, from the good news <laughs> from our perspective is that our net exposure in Russia relative to the size of our balance sheet um, was in the headache, not migraine zone. <laughs> uh, sort of put, put maths on that um, and we'll be releasing our financial results next week. So uh, I'm in a sort of a quiet period. Um, but the, the net exposure uh, was in the small number of hundreds of millions of dollars net. Okay. Um, some of our other competitors obviously had much more significant exposure. Mm. Why didn't we have more exposure, I think, is a more interesting strategic question. Well, why didn't you have more exposure? We were, you know, going back, like I've been in the business for three, uh, 33 years. Oh, my God, that's outrageous. Um, <laughs> I've always been nervous about Russia, the geopolitical risk there. Uh, and in, in a certain way, um, Many years over that period of time, I've kind of challenged myself to say, Donald, is that really the right attitude to have? Because in many ways, they were very good clients because they always paid on time. Russian mm. airlines were excellent pairs, and particularly during COVID, okay? Mm. Um, but there was always a sense that mm, just, you know, doesn't feel comfortable if things went to the, to the downside. Uh, and obviously, Andrew, you were involved in Cape Town and the drafting of that, and you're, you, know, you understand that implicitly. So we just had a sort of a risk off headset towards Russia for years. Um, and as a consequence of that, our portfolio size in Russia was uh, on a relative basis um, small. So if I understand what happened in Russia, the, the, the Russian Civil Aviation Authority effectively, I'm trying to think of the right word here, nationalised the registration of all aircraft in Russia and put them onto the Russian um, registry. Is that under the terms of your leasing arrangements? Would that be a would that be a, a breach, a fundamental breach? Would that equate to a hull loss? Do you think? Well, uh, it is indeed a fundamental breach. Uh, obviously, Avalon complied with the the, the regulatory sanctions, um, you know, immediately um, two months ago. Um, so, what's ultimately happened in Russia is, as you said, they've effectively nationalised the fleet. Um, I've used the word stolen our assets, <laughs> as far as I'm. Yeah. Exactly, and um, you know, I've been quoted at that. That's exactly what's happened. Um, and um, you know, we believe that our aircraft are fully insured under the terms and conditions of our policies, and we will pers be, be pursuing uh, the appropriate claims process in due course. Um, my sense is that um, that's going to be a really interesting and bumpy ride between the lessors and the insurance market. Place. Well, indeed, I was sort of trying to get to the insurance market. If if the 500-odd aeroplanes in Russia, Western aeroplanes that are in Russia, are effectively stolen like this, that's going to put the aviation insurance market under a lot of pressure, isn't it? Yeah, it absolutely is. And, um, I mean, obviously, you have the insurers and then you have the reinsurers and, you know, mm. the, the risk gets dissipated through the insurance market. But nevertheless, you know, ultimately it all consolidates back into a very big number. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how big that number ultimately ends up being, I don't know, but it is many billions of dollars. OK, so the net impact of that it, it subsequently will be that insurance rates will go up uh, for less ores for airlines. Um, the terms and conditions of the insurance policies will probably be cons fundamentally reviewed. Right. Um, there's a possibility that insurers may not offer certain forms of insurance going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, you know, the the implication of this will be many, uh, will be multi multifaceted in the insurance marketplace. But ultimately, um, from an Avalon perspective, uh, as we sit here today, balance sheet exposure here relatively small. Um, we believe we are comprehensively insured. We'll be pursuing that. And um, we'll see how that plays out. Mm. I read somewhere, I think you've got about five aircraft in Russia. Is that, that the right sort of, or exposed to Russia or something in the order of yeah, five? Yeah, we had, we, had, we had 14 originally. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to take uh, possession outside of Russia of four of the 14. So we have a net 10 aircraft right. um, remaining in Russia. Which is still a remarkably low number given that there were more than 500 aeroplanes in, in that situation. Yeah. So your yeah. innate concerns about the Russian market were a, was a very good bet. 
Well, you know, we haven't got all our bets right, Andrew. I mean, mm. you know, we took some big hits during COVID. I mean, um, particularly in Southeast Asia through restructurings chapter 11. So it's not like we're the smartest guys in the box here, okay? <laughs> uh, we, we just got a lucky bounce of the ball on this one. Yep. Um, but, you know, we've taken our hits elsewhere. So, uh, you know, and I think about this not in a sort of a competitive position. You know, I think about this sector. I think about our competitors and us as a sector um, and, and what the implications are for the you know for the aircraft leasing community um and different people get take you know different hits on this one um but together we're going to have to figure out what our attitude is to financing aircraft in the emerging markets in certain of these um more challenging jurisdictions around the world and indeed consequently what are the lease rates what is the risk premium that will be required for us to put our capital to work in some of these jurisdictions it always my view is it's going to go yeah it always comes back doesn't it i mean lessors price on risk. And if the risk is high, the price goes up. It's as easy as that. So, you know, all banks everywhere always charge in accordance with risk. You mentioned Southeast Asia, and that's sort of the next, that's always been touted as the next great market. But what's your vision of the Chinese market? Is that a, uh, is that a market you're interested in getting into? Yeah, well, sorry, let's step back and look at Southeast Asia, ex-China for a okay. second. Okay. Yeah. So, um, we have been, I would say, one of the most uh, active um, participants in Southeast Asia over the last decade. Um, you know, we sat back when we were starting Avalon and said, okay, if, if we were going to have a disproportionate exposure to anywhere in the world, where would it be? And Southeast Asia was absolutely, from our perspective, the place to go. Um, you know, at the, at the most macro level, the demographic uh, metrics are, you know, off the charts. Uh, I've often been quoted as, you know, talking about the, the billion people moving up from, let's just say, the working class up into more of a middle class type of classification, getting off the train for the first time and getting on that low cost carrier for the first time. Hmm. Um, so I'm a, I've been a fundamental believer in that. Um, and we've invested widely and deeply in Southeast Asia and I have backed, you know, airlines like Indigo from the start. Uh, Air Asia, um, we were one of the original lessors there, going all the way out to the Philippines, Cebu. You know, the list the list goes on, right? So we have a major presence in Southeast Asia. We have um, people on site in Singapore and Hong Kong, etc. Then you have China. So China is a very different proposition. It needs to be looked at in its own right. Okay. So we do have a Chinese shareholder, by the way, Andrew. It's, it's, uh, it's a Bo Bohai leasing. I do beg your um, pardon. It's a bank in China, as opposed to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was only I was only being tried there. No. Um, so um, we are a major participant in the Chinese uh, marketplace in terms of the scale of dollars that we have in, in play there. Um, you know, at a macro level, to go back to the big picture for mm -hmm. a second, uh, China will be the dominant aviation market. Uh, in the world for the next 20 or 30 years, unquestionably. Um, there'll be ups and downs along that way. And I'm talking domestic and international. Um, based on our own forecasts today, leaving aside COVID for a second, okay? Uh, because in the Chinese world, that's just a minor bump on mm -hmm. the road. Um, we think China is under ordered today by somewhere between 800 to 1,000 narrow body aircraft Good. and maybe up to 200 wide body airplanes. Um, because think about it, right? China Inc. hasn't ordered any Boeing aircraft for five years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people kind of lose sight of that. That you know, China regularly stepped up into Seattle or and or Toulouse every couple of years in order to be large numbers yeah. of airplanes. They have done. They haven't done so. The the fleet has aged as a consequence, and demand is leaving aside COVID. Demand is only going that way, just given the demographic mm -hmm. backdrop. So China remains a central core and probably the most important aviation market for the next several decades. So do you see yourself purchasing Comac aircraft? Say that again, Andrew? Do you see yourself purchasing Comac aircraft, things like that? Probably not in the short term. Um, you know, we're on watch, you know, not just Comac, but you know, there are other manufacturers around the world. Uh, I think Comac ultimately will be a success. It's probably a success in the middle of the century mm -hmm. rather than this or the next decade. Um, so there'll be a point in time based on either the, the technology of the aircraft and market adoption where the Comac 
aircraft as ultimately defined uh, will become an investable asset class from our perspective. Mm. I think there's an, an inevitability about that. When it's, I think it's still a couple of decades away, um, but I certainly wouldn't underestimate the in strategic influence that Comac will have in the global aviation market right. from the middle of the century. Interesting. Certainly, China is one of the one of the at one of the people at the forefront of the electric uh, and the UA the UAM sort of market. And again, so let's let's move on to that. You've taken a big bet in with a company called Vertical. Um, did I get that one right? Uh, and indeed, aren't you the chairman of Vertical? Um, is that a how far away are we from from UAMs and, and EV toll aircraft actually becoming a thing and being seen out on the out in the skies around us? Yeah, so <clears throat> like any new industry, unless unless you have the ability to see around corners, um, it's difficult to imagine that it will actually happen for most mm. people. Mm. It was difficult for me to think think about that, and I'm in the industry. Um, but what I've learned in the last 12 or 18 months as I've really gotten into this space is it is uh, it's it's not if it's when these airplanes start to fly. Now the good news is that the technology that is required to build these aircraft, uh, whether it's the vertical aircraft or some of the others that are being designed around the world, pretty much most of it already exists, right? Mm. Uh, whether it's battery technology or the flight control systems. Um, most of the stuff is not actually, you know, technology that needs to be designed. The aircraft itself is novel, unquestionably. So that's the first thing. The second thing is Europe. Uh, so EASA and Eurocontrol, in my opinion, have taken a leadership role globally, both in terms of thinking about the certification and design of these aircraft to ensure that the safety standards are frankly akin to an A320 or a 737. Okay, and Eurocontrol in the context of thinking about airspace and the protocols that will be required to allow these airplanes to fly uh, safely and uh, in ubiquitous numbers over time. So I think the regulators in Europe embrace the reality this is coming. So that's really important. Number three, in terms of you know where are we in actually building these machines uh, and the certification process. My gut is. The, we'll probably see the first eVTOLs flying late 2024 and then start to arrive in small numbers globally by 2025. And then it'll take about four or five years of production ramp up. Um, so I think by the start of the next decade, it won't be quite ubiquitous, but they'll become, wow, you know, that, that feels more normal than science fiction. Mm. Uh, and so if you think about some of the places around the world that we're, we're working on right now uh, to put these aircraft uh, into operation, places like Sao Paulo, uh, like Tokyo, like Kuala Lumpur, like Istanbul. None these are the, huge metropolis. None of those, yeah. none of those covered by um, Eurocontrol and EASA, of course. Uh, well, I, 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 was, I could continue with the list, right? So we've got Air <laughs> Greenland, we've got Earth Atlantic, we've got uh, Gozan and Turkey. But the, the, what the, I suppose what I was trying to, to frame for you was that the use case for these airplanes is not, it, it's not in smaller cities. Ultimately. Right. Phase one with the metropolises of the world, right? So if you've ever been to Sao Paulo, I mean, this is an, an enormous mm. city mm. that's getting bigger by the day. Um, and so you've got this urbanization theme and then you've got this decarbonization theme, and this is where they cross over strategically. Um, so, you know, that'll be phase one for the, the use case of these airplanes, large metropolises. Right. Two things at the moment. First of all, there are a lot of putative manufacturers of these aircraft, out, or aircraft airframes, whatever the right word is, uh, out there at the moment, whereas in the traditional industry, we've sort of got to a point where there's two and two half airframe manufacturers. Uh, so yep. do you see there being that sort of consolidation over time in the EV toll market? That's my first question. And the second question is, isn't the rate determining step on all of this the infrastructure? How are we going to charge them? How, where are we going to land them? Things like that. Yeah. So I think, you know, um, the consolidation theme is inevitable, right? Um, uh, how long that takes is 
to be determined because we're way air. I mean, this is Tesla 10 years ago, right? So we're, we're, we're kind of several years away from even consolidation being at the, you know, how do we do this? Who should consolidate and so on and so forth. There are 200 players around the world trying to build EVTOS. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there are four that are public, you know, that have got balance sheets and stuff, of which vertical is one. Um, so consolidation, inevitable. Failures, in, as in uh, failures of design, are certain, mm. inevitable. Um, and so ultimately, you know, where do we get to, say, middle of the next decade? Probably five or six decent-sized OEMs, okay? Because the market opportunity is just so significant. Uh, and the numbers of units that need to be built are infinitely higher, not infinitely, but they're exponentially higher than what Airbus or Boeing are producing. So you'll need more than, than two manufacturers, right? Um, so that's my gut. That's not built on some scientific view. Consolidation for sure, failures for sure, and probably settles in with five or six key players. Mm, mm. On the infrastructure piece, that is the key enabler. Where they're going to land and how they're going to be charged. The good news there is that some of the key players in, in those sectors today are already fully engaged in this piece. So on the infrastructure side, globally, airport operators and or infra players, you know, so people who are who build stuff are now thinking about where these vertiports can and should be built. I'll give you a working example in a second. Mm -hmm. And obviously the charging piece is really the most important because you have to think of these eVTOLs a bit like your razor blade, right? The, the battery is the razor. It'll get replaced every five or six months. And so that battery will be then, you know, repurposed for some other use. So the, the charging and the battery lifecycle management is the key part of this technology once the airplane's designed and certified. Now, just to share with you the real world for a moment in terms of vertiports, um, JAL um, in Japan uh, is one of our, 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 our customers and we're our launch customer in, in Japan on the airline side. Um, Japan is hosting the Osaka Expo in 2025, so it's a big deal for Japan. I was in Osaka actually uh, three weeks ago and uh, working with our, our shareholder and our partner in Japan, Oryx, they've already identified in Osaka where the first vertiport will be in the Expo uh, site. Yeah, And that particular site is... Uh, between 15 to 30 kilometers from Kansai, Osaka Export, uh, Osaka Downtown, and Kobe, right? So imagine in three or four years' time, shucking these people in from these airports into Osaka. And I don't know if you've ever been to Osaka, but it's a huge, huge city. And we flew over in a helicopter just to have a look at how many landing pads are on the office buildings, most of which are not used. Mm -hmm. So there's already a very significant infrastructure uh, set up in place that is just just underutilized and sao paulo is the same sao paulo has more uh helipads per capita than any city in the world yeah, yeah. well uh, but you, you've raised a really interesting point there and it's also true for paris with the 24 olympics and so forth we're looking at a situation at the moment where jowl wants to both run the service and run the infrastructure which, of course, we got out of in aviation almost from the Wright brothers forward. Uh, do you see, and, and that then leads to stuff like the ATM systems, the UTM systems that, that are going to be part of how we integrate this into the airspace. There's need, there will need to be a lot of work and a lot of change in that area, won't there? Yeah, I think a lot of capital, a lot of work, but what we're seeing globally in these, what we call these joint working groups, you know, that we've got going on in different parts of the world, it is actually the airlines have a very mature perspective on this. They're not trying to be all things to all men or women, right? Um, the airlines in, 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 in the conversations we're having with them, they see themselves as sales and marketing um, outfits, not the fully vertically integrated player. Right. So I, 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 you know, the vertiports will be operated by ABC. The um, charging will be operated by somebody else. Now they may all well be part of one big uh, company of which Avalon and, and Avalon E may well be a shareholder. So we're reimagining, right, how these transportation businesses will be owned and set up. Um, and, you know, for example, down in Brazil, Gol, we are likely to, to ultimately establish a brand new company that's part owned by Gol, part owned by Comporte, which is the 
the, the, the family uh, shareholder of Gol, which is the largest bus and private train operator in Brazil, part owned by a major Latin American infrastructure player, and we'll actually be announcing that player in a few weeks' time, and part owned by us. It'll be branded Gol, leveraged into the Gol um, booking system, frequent flyer program, but a de novo outfit outside hmm. of the airline, so to speak. And so you have to think of it about we're creating new new transportation businesses that will reimagine uh, transportation, but working with their airline partners. The the are you working with local councils as well? I mean, historically, aviation has dealt with CAAs because you know we fly generally speaking, well above everybody's heads. These things are going to be a lot closer to citizens, aren't they? Security, safety, those sorts of issues, are go and privacy, I guess, are going to be much more important considerations than traditionally in aviation. That is correct. And that's why uh, the engagement and work with Eurocontrol, um, you know, as we think about what are the appropriate protocols globally is really important. So these aircraft are probably likely to fly uh, in crews somewhere between two and 4,000 feet. You know, that's the current thinking. Might be a little higher, but not much. Um, the so really important thing to remember, though, is these aircraft are 100 times quieter than a helicopter. Mm. And that mm. is ultimately, outside of the cost, why helicopters have just not been embraced by society. A hundred times, very loud. A hundred times quieter than a helicopter doesn't mean very quiet. They're so loud, helicopters. Well, okay, so let me, let, me, let me sort of make the unfamiliar more familiar, right? Um, when this airplane is in full cruise, it will have the same sound as an air conditioning machine right. from the ground. You, you won't hear it. It'll mm. be white noise. Mm. Um, so a key part of the stakeholder group here are, are the local cities. Um, obviously, the, the, the air navigation uh, control systems for various parts of the world to basically get everybody comfortable with this. Is These are safe to fly. And remember what I said at the start, the certification standards that IASA have set here are actually 10 to the minus nine. So the mm. same as a normal seven aircraft. three. Yeah. Yeah. The FAA actually are adopting 10 to the minus three currently. So that that that's going to become a very interesting strategic issue in the industry globally, outside of the United States and outside of Europe. What do other uh, regulatory authorities adopt as the preferred standard? My view is they want to adopt the most safest, wouldn't you? Um, so right now, the, the, the standards set by IASA are, are extremely stringent and appropriately so. Ultimately, the point there is when we're getting to have conversations with um, city planners or regular, you're able to point to the safety metrics of these airplanes. And our aircraft has a, um, you know, it's got a 15 meter span wing, right? So a catastrophic event is, is almost, it's one in one billion, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, so hopefully, ultimately, we'll be able to convince local planners and regulators that the, stand, the safety standards are so high that a catastrophic event is literally one in one billion. Right. Which is, you know, what it should be, of course, if you're going to put people on these things. Do you see them being unpiloted from the start? Or do you think we'll go through a phase of having pilots on board and then leaving, losing the pilots? Yeah, so there's a debate on this one, okay? Um, so when I talk to um, our, our partners at Boeing, um, they believe that autonomous travel is te technically feasible and regulatory feasible from later in this decade, okay? So the airplane that they are building, their eVTOL, mm -hmm. they are building it to be autonomous from the outset. Um, the flight control systems that we have in the vertical aircraft are the same flight control systems that are in the F-35 as designed by Honeywell, as adapted for a commercial environment, okay? So theoretically, they are autonomous, actually. Mm. Our view our view right now is it will be a massive hurdle for the regulators, be it FAA or EASA, to certify an autonomous eVTOL with passengers in the back. Um, and I think from a societal, you know, just a psychological perspective, I, I think people will just not be ready or prepared to get into an aircraft because it's an airplane that doesn't have a pilot. But we're in the business of trying to figure out what's going to happen in 20, 30 or 40 years from time. Autonomous eVTOLs are absolutely inevitable. Okay. And for our children's children, it will be de, de regard, if you like. Mm, mm. But my view, we're probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 years away from the regulators 
getting comfortable with autonomous EV tow. So we'll see. Um, our bet is pilot at first. But we'll have the technology to be autonomous in due course, but we'll go pilot at first. Okay. Well, that's. Uh, as as you say, I can imagine that's going to be quite reassuring to a lot of people. We're nearly at the end. Let me ask a couple of sort of standard questions. What's your favourite aircraft? Um, well, none that are in my current fleet, let's put it that way, right? <laughs> the next one, yes. Um, no, my absolute, like, my go-to aeroplane, the one that I'm in love with, the one that um, excites me when I, when I get to see it, or every now and again I might hear it, is the Connie constellation, uh, and that that for me, um, you know, still even when I say that, the hair goes up in the back of the neck. I mean, that is just aerosexual, right? It absolutely. just excites me. It's it's the way the they look like look dolphins look. coming in front of a wave to the shape of them. The You're most, talking to an ex noise. Yeah. Oh, the noise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that remains still my favorite airplane, um, and I wish I owned one. Oof. Well, you know, you and John Travolta. The um, and, and your favourite airport? My favourite airport? That, well, that is the easiest answer ever. Because I'm obviously Irish. Um, well, hopefully it's obvious. Uh, I was Pretty born, clear. as was my brother, as was my brother John. We were born in, in the west of Ireland uh, in a place called County Clare. Um, but right in the middle of County Clare is an airport called Shannon Airport. And so by a country mile, Shannon Airport is my favorite airport in the world because that's where I first smelled kerosene. My, my father had a business in the six, 1960s and 70s supplying fresh fruit and vegetables to the flight kitchen at Shannon Airport, which at the time, Andrew, you might remember, was one of the busiest flight kitchens Indeed. in the world. Yeah. And so as it, like a little nipper, age four or five, being brought to Shannon with dad on the delivery on a Saturday and I remember distinctly seeing a Pan Am 747-100. It would have been around 1972. And spent that kerosene for the first time and going, oh, my God. <laughs> this, this, this feels good. Um, so, Shannon, without a doubt. Oh, excellent. And my last question, and I suspect I already know the answer to this, is what more do you think Eurocontrol should be doing to support aviation? Look, I think Eurocontrol under Eamon Brennan's um, guide, in fact, Eurocontrol for, for a very long time. Um, you know, when I think of Eurocontrol, I think of a regulator that listens actively. OK. And, you know, when, when, traveling around the world, talking to some of our other airlines about some of their other regulatory stakeholders, they feel like they're, they're beating their head against a wall sometimes. Eurocontrol listens. Um, it, it is very much on the front foot. Uh, it's constantly reimagining its relevance and its role, and I think does a fantastic job representing Europe and European airspace on the global um, on the global marketplace. And it's perceived as such and rated as such. So I think Eamon and the team continue to do a fantastic job representing all Europeans, and indeed including the UK, where I think it's you know it's important to recognise even post Brexit. Euro control is responsible for that airspace. Well, indeed. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found that as interesting as I did. We talked across a range of topics, sustainability, the leasing market, Russia, EV tolls. Uh, all I can do is thank Donald again for his time. I found that absolutely fascinating. I hope you did. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thanks very much. Thank you.